that operates like a Section 8 voucher payment. And then it's it's ultimately not enough money, and so the, the, the city found another way to bring more money in. And then, then what happens is because it's now made into a voucher, it's a, it's a predictable payment stream that we can then get a mortgage against, which allows money to come in to do the rehab. And so one of the challenges, I honestly forget the scale, but it's a very big number, yeah. like, I don't know, 200 million, 300, like some humongous number of capital improved, like re repairs, like elevator repairs, plumbing repairs, flooring repairs, that, that the Housing Authority was not able to make. Right. Not really, I mean, th this housing authority didn't function very well, but even if it had functioned well, it cost a certain amount of money to operate, to pay a property manager, to pay a maintenance person. And so these properties are, you know, have suffered from years of not really having appropriate maintenance done, and then so the, the, the physical structure has suffered. And so this program is intended to be like a one-time infusion of, of money to make those big, big improvements. and. Um, and then, over, and then it's also intent, the program is also intended to then, partly because the housing authority was not doing a great job managing, to also replace them as a manager. And so, um, we have had a very good experience in the first <coughs> few buildings that we went into, where you know we had enough contact with with residents explaining who we are, and what we were going to do, and now we're doing it and we're responding to work orders. That it has been so far a good experience. A lot of yeah, <laughs> it's a huge undertaking. Like thousands no, no. of people probably are actually working on it. Do you have a question? Piggyback on what you were saying about uh, funding, mm -hmm. um, I belong to an organization in Washington that monitors Congress. Mm -hmm. And back in the Bush administration, Bush II, um, Congress started making people what they call PHAs, which are public housing authority organizations. Um, and then subsequently, since the housing crisis of 2009 hardened down to all Section 8 buildings, that um, they only get six to nine months a year funding from Washington. And they, are, they have to run on reserves the rest of the time. So this is a nationwide disaster that is just now starting to come to light as public housing authorities across this country are starting to fail because they simply cannot maintain their property the way the various different codes in all the cities require um, because of the massive cut in uh, Congress. What a question. I'm, I'm just curious, well, how, what is the length of the lease you have with the, uh, with the uh, housing authority? Oh, the authority? ground lease? Yeah. Um, I think technically it's a 75-year ground lease with a 24-year extension. So they're typically set up to be 99 years, and then there's reasons we have to structure it a little bit differently, but that's basic. So it's intended to be basically in perpetuity. And so that's to address a couple things. The, I think one thing is to address the concern that the housing stock is being lost as a public good. And so, and then the second reason is that because now private financing is being introduced, the city and the housing authority have more leverage in any kind of negotiation around what happens with the property in the future by virtue of having that they have both the ground lease and they also have their own debt on the property. Um, so those two that I just mentioned are under construction and the next two I wanted to mention are um, in phase two and that's 350 Ellis which is just up the street two doors down from Clyde and then Clementina Towers which is in the south of Market. It's on Clementina between fifth and fourth. And um, these two developments we expect to close on the construction financing and begin construction this fall, probably in September. Um, some of the kind of distinguishing features about these is that 350 Ellis we are developing in partnership with Glide. Um, Glide has, Glide owns um, three different family housing, uh, sorry, three different developments that serve families and individuals in the Tenderloin, and they provide services to those buildings and to others. And so in our partnership with them, they will be a part of the ownership, and they will also be providing services. And so the particular Glide institution we're working with is Glide Community Housing, and so they have been involved with us as we come up with the design and the services program. Um, 
And Clementina Towers, the distinguishing feature of that is it's large. <laughs> it's 274 units, it's very big. Um, and that is the property where it was in the news a lot, where there's like four elevators, and at one point I think they were all down, which is unconscionable. I don't know how that actually came to pass. Does anyone have any, the, the other issues are basically. How many elevators do they have and how many uh, towers? There's two towers, I believe there's two elevators in each tower. Okay, just trying to vision it. So, they, so each tower has its own set of elevators. Yes, mm -hmm. and right now they're totally separate. One of our improvements is gonna have a little bit more of a breezeway to create some some common connection space. There's a large contingent of homeless that periodically attach themselves to the wall in front of 350 others. I have a lovely yes. view out my window. Oh, do you? So um, I'm very, so I, just, uh, I have two parts on this. One, I don't like seeing homeless people on the street. Um, the two, people that are there should have a right to stay there. Um, so have you thought about making a um, uh, accommodation for the people who tend to attach themselves to that wall. Fortunately, right now, nobody's doing it on a semi-permanent basis, but they have in the past. Yeah, it's a good question, and I... Um... And they don't all attend, why? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think there has been some initial hope. It may be naive, and I actually can't tell you anything more beyond the hope but it's worth me exploring more pointedly, especially since we're close to starting construction, that because Glide is just down the street, and there al there's also a line that forms when they're doing their food distribution that stretches in front of the Housing Authority property. Like, is there something by Glide's involvement in the building that they can help us more actively or differently manage that line, and also when encampments do arise right there? I mean, as you're talking, I don't, I don't know that we've contemplated, and I don't know if it would actually be a good thing, but my first thing is, well, is the wall helpful? Like, would removing the wall help? And I don't know if we've ever even no. talked about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I, the answer is I don't it, know. It, it, I mean, the whole purpose of the wall is a security wall. Right. Um, to, uh, but I also think that, um, because I get a lovely view of the food line three times a day, all the time. So um, my, Biggest concern is people who seem to become displaced um, at odd hours and end up with nine or ten or twelve bags of stuff and are virtually living in front of the wall. Right. And they move their stuff up at night to the wall, move it back to the curbing, and this is this is where they do. And most times, I am having to call the station to get them the, in, the move them somewhere else. Right. And um, I, I really worry that I see why doing nothing. I have heard that complaint. For mm -hmm. the people on the sidewalk, except chase them away mm -hmm. when they want to do their food run. Right. And if Clyde's going to step up to, to his neighborhood, then they ought to step up on that interpretation too. Mm -hmm. So it might be something that you can work on to try and get some balance in it. Yeah, I appreciate you raising the concern. It's something we thought about early on, and I don't recall being part of any recent active conversation, so I will certainly talk about that again. Especially, I think it's prescient because we will be part of, I mean, TVC will then be part of the management soon. And can then complain to us as well. I have a question that's kind of tangentially uh, related to just about marginalized communities. That area where the Clementine Towers was, which is started with the Pino at one point, right? Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding that uh, in some ways the Clementine Towers re reflects that. Uh, is that our uh, are, are you guys, can you guys do anything that, that, would, that would help preserve what, what, what remains of the sort of community in that area? Um, I mean, I think broadly in terms of south of market, I think you know Lorenzo on yeah, our right. staff, our team's community organizing staff. I believe he himself is Filipino. I know he's very active in the Filipino community in Soma. And um, so I think in, in those, through those avenues where trying to be of support to that community. Um, in terms of Clementina itself, I don't actually have the demographic information with me. I do have a summary of that back at the office. I mean, what I hear people talk about most 
is it has a very it has a very high number of Chinese Americans, and I can't remember. I'm betray my general ignorance. I think generally it's more Cantonese in San Francisco, which I think is the case in that building, but I'm not totally sure. Um, I do know. You know, when, if for all for for all of the developments, when we go and do community meetings, we make sure that we have translators that can speak those languages. And so I can't remember. I know that the languages that we are encountering most common in the tenants in all of these buildings is um, is Chinese and um, Russian and Vietnamese. And I'm not sure if there's enough Tagalog speakers that we have had a Tagalog um, interpreter, but we are putting written materials. In Tagalog. Are there any other questions about? Yes. I have two more. Okay. Uh, so the last two, I do want to be conscious of time. Um, these are these are buildings that are owned by TNEC. Uh, so the first one is O'Farrell Towers. It's located on O'Farrell. Um, it's about 100 units of project based Section 8. Um, and it is having a rehab to kind of improve the exterior skin to address water intrusion issues. And then we're also updating the units. And we are also, right now it doesn't have any space like this for resident meetings, so we are building an addition to create that space. Um, some of you may be familiar with the building because on the ground floor there is a senior center that is operated by Northern California Presbyterian Homes and Services. And so though that use is going to continue, um, they will be somewhat affected by the rehab and we're working with them on that. But um, basically that program is there, will still be there, will be there in the future. Does anyone have any questions about that one? Okay, so then the last one, you've been very patient, is the Yosemite Apartments. So this is a beautiful, um, historic building. It's 32 um, studio units. It's up the street on Eddy in the 400 block. And it's one of the earliest acquisitions that TNDC made. So when TNDC was first founded, a lot of the strategy was to buy existing buildings and just get them into nonprofit ownership and control and have you know the ownership and the way that they were run, have the intention of um, continuing to serve low-income people by having lower rents. Um, yes? Word blocking. What? Blocking. Blocking? Yeah, it was about having one building on every block so we can go. Yes. Yes, that was part of the strategy. Um, so we've owned that building for a long time, but we have never done a, a comprehensive rehab of it. So we are planning a really comprehensive rehab right now. We will be doing seismic improvements, um, accessibility improvements, a big thing around path of travel, getting into the building, um, navigating into the laundry room. Um, we'll be replacing the elevator um, and updating the units. They, we've owned it for more than 30 years. Um, and we haven't updated the unit, so they'll be getting new kind of kitchens and bathrooms and, and whatnot. Um, and so we're really excited. We found a, we've been wanting to work on that project since before I joined TNDC, and we found a, a way to do it um, accessing some state financing. So we are crossing our fingers. That one, we haven't won the state award, so it's not for sure, um, but we are working really hard to seize this opportunity and pull the financing to make this one happen. Do you have any questions? Yes. Well, are those residents then going to see um, kind of a long-term or uh, uh, reso uh, relocation? Relocate those residents for a long period of time during this rehab? Or is it you know, I don't know that we've determined how long, but our, our, our plan is to do it like we have been doing the RAD development. So we would probably I'm just speculating, like we are very early on. But we just have done our schematic design um, on it. We would probably try to vacate a floor and then rotate people through that floor. But I don't. I think you're asking about the duration. Will it be two weeks or four weeks or six weeks? I don't. I don't know that yet. That's true. Do you have a question? So you know about the doll shootings. That was during the rehab where the relocation was not done completely well. Uh huh. Oh yeah, I had not heard about that before, but I know Lori Linker, who worked on 
relocation at the time. I'm sure she Relocation is important. Tell it me is. more. Yeah, so I mean, if, if you guys are interested, I can, relocation is important and it's, it's really challenging. And to be really transparent, we, we've had to work on it over the last year. Um, you know, we used to have in-house relocation staff, Lori, who has been with the company for a long time, started there. She now does fund development and, um, you know, works to bring in funding for our program. Um, so we, we partner between housing development and property management on um, managing that work. Um, I don't know if you guys have encountered, because I know many of you are familiar with TNDC or have lived in buildings, a guy named Mike South, who was most recently at the Ambassador. He used to be the front desk person at 215, which is our property management main office. He's our um, relocation for me, like our man in the field. So I'm really pleased that he's in that role because I think he's a very good fit. Like he's been in our buildings, he understands the tenant population, he understands you know, the way we manage, and he's worked in the front desk, so he also understands sort of the corporate um, infrastructure. And I think it's really important important in that role to be, you know, he's got familiar with kind of familiar with all these different aspects. And I also think he has a really good attitude, you know, and I think I appreciate what you're saying. It is people have varying responses to 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 change, as particularly older people or disabled people with limited mobility or people with limited English who may not really understand what's happening. So I mean and I can just say personally like I worked in a, I lived in a building and it went up for sale and it's just, I, I have income and I, I speak English and it's still like, what's gonna happen to me? Am I gonna have to move? Like, so it's, it is, um, it is disconcerting. And so, older people. Huh? Older seniors. Right, yeah, older people. Yes, and so we have, we have been, part of what we're handling and then I see Curtis has a question is, we're doing initial, like we're doing like big meetings, but then we're also meeting with people one on one. So we're just starting to do that for the RAD phase twos. And in those meetings, it helps us get some information around um, how nervous someone is about the move. So like how much support we're going to need to provide to them. Do they have family that they can rely on, or are they they're on their own in terms of interpreting what's happening and planning for that? You know, do they have? a lot of stuff that is gonna take some extra time for us to manage dealing with that stuff. Do they have pets? I mean, so there's a number of things that came up for us. I mean, TDC has done this a long time, and then there's like the staff at TDC who have varying degrees of having actually done this themselves, right? And so in the first wave of relocation of the RAD phase ones, we definitely encountered some things that we are gonna be more prepared for next time. Right, so one of them was like, a fish tank, how do you relocate a fish tank? Like we weren't really, didn't have that all dialed in before. Um, you know, a big issue is people have programming available to them in different languages from their home country. How do we make sure that we're facilitating that? So there's a lot of little things that need to be, details that need to be managed. So. Um, we understand it's important and we're working on it and I think there's areas where we need to improve and we're working on those. So I think to the extent if you guys, I appreciate the general question and if there's any more specific feedback, I'm, I'm happy to hear it now. Yes. Uh, one, just general blanket for everything. Uh, we have one person in this building who is deaf. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's any units in any of your projects <coughs> that in the <coughs> for either deaf people, blind people, or deaf and blind people. The other part of it is, have you considered doing any uh, projects with uh, hospital housing or um, housing for people with multiple diagnosis disabilities? So to the first question, this development must have been I know it was done a while ago. Yeah, so now it, in the in the rad the rad developments, I believe this is happening, and certainly in all the new construction projects. Now, at least um, in in most of the country, if you have HUD financing, at least five percent of the units need to be fully built out for people. It's set up mostly for people with physical disabilities, and then within that same five percent, two percent have to be set up for folks with that are hearing or vision impaired. In, in San Francisco, they actually require 
um, I believe it's 10% for physical disability.